morning, church. How are you? Good morning. My goodness, it's winter for, it's winter till about 11 o'clock this morning. But um, did it rain where you lived? I mean, did it rain? Did it, did it, did it rain or did it mist? It rained? It rained in Irvine. Yeah? Mar- yeah? I missed it. it. Just, we had missed. That's why I'm asking you. But hey, real quick, you guys, some very important things. Did you get this handout? Please look at it. Um, wow. If you don't think that um, faith matters, if you don't think that engaging the culture matters, you need to think again. Uh, we look to our police uh, officers to defend us. That's how this system works. And now they need our defending. So we need all of you to respond to this. This is a statewide alert. That means that this real impact announcement is going out to all the churches in the state of California uh, to make sure that they take action, that we take action. You need to make sure that you follow action step one and two, and we need to do it right away. Please don't put this on your dashboard or under your seat and forget about it, because if you are a Christian police officer and your worldview is known or you express it regarding the issues that are listed on the information front of this alert then you can be absolutely uh, disciplined, chastised, who knows what will happen. But if this bill passes, then a police officer will not be allowed to have an opinion expressed regarding those items that are listed on this warning sheet here. This is not a joke. California, as you well know, is out of control. And unless it changes, and I know everybody... I. Everybody's saying it can't change. It can't change. Uh, the corruption is, is horrific. Uh, all that is true. Uh, but we can't give up on doing what's good. Uh, the, the, one, of the biggest, one of the biggest problems in California, it's not the Democrat Party. That uh, Democrat Party is a manifestation of what happens when parents are not at home. When the parents are, at, are not at home... The kids go nuts with all kinds of stuff. They're shooting guns and they're driving cars through buildings and they're leaving the bathtub overflowing and uh, eating eating you know donuts for breakfast. That's that's the Democrat Party in California. And you want to know why that happens? Because the Republican Party in California is worse. The Republican Party has allowed this to continue because they cannot. And they have not been able to create a candidate. And when we, the people, find a candidate, the the Republican Party refuses to get behind that candidate. Did you know that? So I don't know, uh, but until the Lord comes back or we die, it is we, the people. And so we need to make noise about what is right and we need to expose what's wrong. But my understanding of the Bible re, uh, does not allow, there's no room for me to be a spectator in my culture. If you disagree, then check on this passage. Jesus said, I gave you a responsibility. I gave one to everybody. But you, you took it and you buried it in the earth and you waited until I would come back so that you would just give it back to me, never, never invest it. And Jesus says, you're a wicked servant. Isn't that amazing? Don't bury the opportunity. Amen. And so we need, to make, we need to be a church that makes uh, light to shine. And, and salt to be tasted in our culture. But I tell you what, you could not pay me enough, and I mean that, to be a police officer in this, in this state. In this nation today. And my dear friends, without them, you're on your own. You're on your own. And so I'm very passionate about this, as you can tell. So let's look at something more lighthearted. So I'm going to show you a video. Are you guys all listening? 
I'm going to show you a video that uh, came out uh, regarding the Ukrainian-Russian war that is underway. And uh, we'll analyze this for a second, because I told you I was going to be giving you some updates, but this one is with a little flair. So can you guys roll the video? Look, I, you know, we're going to use the at least, at least 59 people killed, at least 149 people wounded. Those numbers are going to go up. There's just no question about that. I mean, you have fierce fighting in a number of locations around the country. You mentioned Chernobyl. Russian forces quickly overtaking that area. We understand they are still in control. The other thing that went, hap- went down today um, that was of huge importance was Russian paratroopers went into an airfield 15 miles outside of Kiev, and for a short period of time this afternoon, they held... Okay, well, obviously there's a resurrection problem taking place. Did you see that? How many dead? 57 dead in the war? 50 something? Okay. (laughs) 57, yeah. That was uh, all over the news, all over the world. In fact, when the video began to play, I heard you say... Oh, it got you, didn't it? That was a couple of years ago. That was from an environmental protest. Those people were representing so many tens of thousands of people that will die because of global warming. So what happened? The media grabbed it and they made it a Ukrainian-Russian war clip. The only problem is that one guy kept coming back to life. Be careful what you see, what you hear, what you read. Know the truth. And if it's on broadcast media these days, probably not true. So watch out for that. And then one final thing. We were super, super blessed to be invited by the Salem Broadcasting Network to uh, participate in an event that they host from time to time that is titled Ask a Jew ask a Gentile. And I was honored to represent Team Gentile. And what happened was, uh, for about 90 minutes, uh, a moderator asked Dennis Prager and I questions regarding the world, regarding America, and regarding faith. And um, we really encourage you to check it out. It's really making some big numbers in the social media world. People are watching this and listening, and um, it was was a fun moment because one of the questions, I'll I'll, I'll set you up to excite you. One of the questions the moderator asked was, uh, Dennis, you do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and so can you argue why that's true? And then Jack, you do believe that Jesus is the Messiah, so can you argue also why you think that is true? And so go. <laughs> and, um, and so there was not only Gentiles in the audience, but Jews as well. And so the moment was given to witness to not only my good friend Dennis Prager, yet again, honestly, yeah. but to those that were in the crowd. And then I also felt burdened about how the Gentiles in the audience, they need to know how to present Christ from the Old Testament. Don't never go to the New Testament when talking to a Jew. Never, don't do that. But listen, do what Paul the Apostle did and what Peter did. Use the Bible. And the Bible that they had in those days was the Old Testament. <laughs> and so uh, go ahead and, and look, take a look, take a listen and share it with others. Apparently God is using it uh, to reach a lot of people. And we're excited about that. So uh, very, very um, important evangelistic tool, it turns out right now. So church, with that, let's stand, if you would, and open our Bibles to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 in our study. We're looking at now part 2 of this message titled, When Eyes Can Hear Us. When eyes can hear us, people hear what we're about by what they see lived out in our lives. Remember that quote from last week? I don't have it in the notes again, but remember the, the quote that says uh, something to the effect, uh, preach the gospel 
at all times. <laughs> and when necessary, use words. Because your life should be what people see, and what they see will be what they hear. You can preach all day long the glories of the kingdom of God and of Jesus, but if people see a life being lived contrary to that truth, they won't believe your words. And boy, is this a... A topic being talked about today, probably on news channels, where unsurprisingly, I'm sad to say, just this last week, the founder of Hillsong uh, had his name and his exploits splashed across the world headlines. And the part that grieves me is the name of Jesus in there. If you remove the, the name Jesus out of it, I wouldn't care. And if you, if, you take, if you take the word church out of there, I wouldn't care because it would sound just like any other scandal. But Jesus' name this Sunday is being drugged through the mud because somebody uh, couldn't stay faithful to his wife and stay away from drugs and, and now it's, it's world, world news. No, the truth of the matter is, church, when eyes can hear us, that should be a wake-up call to all of us. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 8, and we are in part 2 of this message today. And verse 1 begins, what then shall we say, argues the Apostle Paul, that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh. For what does the scripture say? And he's quoting now. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. But to him who does not work but believes. On him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is accounted for righteousness. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Verse 8. Wow. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Wow. You may be seated, church. John Wesley made his famous uh, statement regarding this conversion. He said, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I've mentioned this in uh, messages in the past because it's worthy of note. And let me read it to you as John Wesley uh, writes this. And I quote, in the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldergate where one was reading Luther's, that's Martin Luther's preface, to the epistle of the book of Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust Christ, Christ alone, for salvation. And an assurance was given to me that had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death, wrote John Wesley. From that moment, an already famous man, him and his brother Charles and John Wesley, friends of the great George Whitfield, the greatest uh, evangelist of, of probably American history. I mean, that's, uh, I, I know Billy Graham is in there, but uh, George Whitfield, you got to read about his life. His good friend John Wesley had been ordained was a pastor, an evangelist. And he confesses he wasn't born again. He woke up to the fact, I don't even know Christ personally. And he wound up hearing that God will justify the ungodly by faith based upon the merits of Jesus Christ. What Jesus did at the cross and by leaving us an empty tomb, that 
atonement for our sins and justification by his righteousness, the ungodly by belief is declared godly. And we humans have a hard time with that, but God doesn't have a hard time with that because that is God's economy. If you were to take the U.S. dollar and if you were to go to some other part of the world, uh, you may not be able to buy anything because you need to exchange that money. In a sense, you could have a $10,000 bill, if that even exists, I don't know, but if you had one and you went to some country, it's worthless until you convert it. Then it becomes usable. Why? Because you're talking the currency of that realm, of that government, of that country. When you and I think that you and I can get to heaven by being good and keeping the rules and being moral and being religious, God does not even see that kind of currency. It doesn't, it doesn't translate. It's meaningless in his world. In our world, it means everything. In his world, it means nothing. But dear friends, our world has got a very short lifespan to it and an expiration date. And we're going to be, we're going to be, so to speak, getting on board and the ship is going to set sail and we're going to go into eternity. And there's only one currency that God will accept when you approach almighty God. And it's going to be the currency of the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you come along and you say, yeah, yeah, I got the blood of Jesus Christ, but I also got this and I did the other thing and I was a good guy and, and I didn't do the other thing and I did all those things. And I got to tell you right now, that is a uh, counterfeit currency and it will be ejected by God. It will be refused by God. We need to stop thinking that somehow our estimate has value regarding the eternal kingdom. It does not. And it's a shock and it's an eye opener. Listen, uh, just by way of review quickly, because we didn't get very far and that's nothing new to you guys, but uh, and, and we'll go as far as we can today. But rem- we remember and we read just a moment ago two key uh, patriarchal fathers of faith and of the Jewish people. And, and I say of the Jewish people and of faith, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in there as a Gentile and say, these guys are on my team too. I should say I'm on their team. And that is Abraham, first of all. Let's hear it for Abraham. Uh, woo! <laughs> Abraham was first a Jew before, uh, first a Gentile before he became a Jew. He was first a Gentile before he became a Jew. It's very important. And God declared him righteous be- 400 years before the law was ever given. Moses wasn't even alive yet. And God declared him righteous. And, he, and God declared him righteous even before circumcision was implemented. That was years later. And then you look at the life of David. And we all love David because we saw last week in Psalm 27 that David is the one that said, imagine all the wealth that he had, all the power and the victory and the presence of God. It's David who said, there's one thing that I desire and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. And he's not talking about the earthly temple on earth. He's talking about God's presence in heaven forever. And both of these men have a lot in common, but this at the top, priority number one, they had faith in God. They, they believed God. David believed God when he confronted Goliath. He trusted God. You don't run up to a nine foot, six inch tall, uncircumcised Philistine that's ready to do battle. But David did as a teenager. And a lot of cute things are written about all that kind of stuff. But one thing sums it up perfectly. And it's this. David, you know, David ran toward Goliath. Did you know that? Goliath didn't run up. No, no. David ran toward Goliath. Can you imagine Goliath standing there looking at this? Look at this. Here comes a flea. There's a little flea coming at me. And, uh, And don't doubt David's faith. Because it's been well said that David didn't see the size of Goliath. David saw the size of his God standing behind Goliath. David is running actually toward his God. And Goliath got in the way. And to double down on that faith of his. How many stones did it take to kill Goliath? Actually that's not true. I just made a boo-boo. The stone didn't kill him. The stone knocked him out. 
So how many stones did it take to knock out Goliath? A little boy cannot throw one stone at a giant's head and knock him out. I think the moment David pulled that stone out and let it go from his sling, I think an angel got behind it and turned it into a cruise missile. But down he went, he was stunned. And the best part, guys, right? The best part is David goes up there, grabs that gigantic sword out of his sheath. He's got Goliath's sword and he puts it on his neck and it's there. And David just starts to go like this. And he just cuts the giant's head off. And he was so fond of that. The Bible tells us that David walked around with Goliath's head. Now you got to live in the Middle East to appreciate that. That's like, oh, right, right on. Uh, We don't get it in the West, uh, but um, he had faith. He also had enough faith to put four other stones in that pouch of his. Because when you read the Bible, you find out that they, uh, that Goliath's brothers are named by name in the Bible. He had four brothers. There were five of those guys. So David was not only ready to take out Goliath, just in case his brother showed up, he believed that God would give him the power to do that too. These are men of faith. It's powerful. We saw last time together when eyes can see us, we saw that there's nowhere to hide. And we saw that in a good way. It's all a positive way. We saw that our flesh testifies against us. That's a good thing. Because we learned in verse 1 that Abraham has nothing to boast about before the Father, uh, before God, I should say, because his flesh. What did he learn about his flesh? Is that his flesh could not produce righteousness. That is a great, wonderful positive to any man or woman. Today, boy or girl who wakes up to the reality, I cannot do this thing called Christianity. I can't do it. I need God's help. And what a happy day that is when you come to the realization that to be a Christian is to let go. Doesn't that, I know that sounds so hallmark. Like, oh, just let go. And you know that baloney? Somebody wrote something somewhere. If you love something, set it free. And if it's yours, it will come back to you. That is insane. That is so not true. That's written by the guy who wanted to leave the relationship. Just set up. If if you love me, you'll set me free. No, listen. Not true. No, Abraham has nothing to boast of. When he looked at his flesh, he could determine... There's nothing in me. God justified me by his mercy, his, his revelation, his what? His grace, his, uh, how about this? His preemptive move. I love that. God, in a preemptive way, reached out to Abraham and pulled him out of Ur of the Chaldees. As a Gentile, we saw last time, and this is where we ended, by the way, is the latter part of verse 2. And we saw that our deeds can never measure up. And that's a positive. We should all go, ah. Do you remember I stressed this last week? If you're thinking, okay, I'm going to be, just tell me what to do, Pastor, and I'll just, I'll do it, and I'll be right with God. Okay? Listen, when you hear that your deeds do not measure up, you get very depressed about that. That's why legal, people who are legalistic are very bummed out people. They don't have any joy. The more you realize that your actions can never measure up to the standard of God, that's when you say, or that's when you do this. You throw your arms up and surrender. And you realize, wow, man, I, what is this? And God will whisper to you, if you haven't already heard him say, you follow me. I will do this thing called Christianity through you. And this is the great missing testimony of the church in America, if not the world today, is that churchianity runs around trying to make itself cool and, uh, you know, how do we relate? And we've got to be able to be relevant. We've got to be able to pull off this. We've got to look just like the world so the world will come in and, and, and see us. You know why churches do that stuff? Because they don't have the power of the Holy Spirit present. You want to know why? Because they're not teaching the Bible. The Bible, when the Bible's presented, the Holy Spirit has to show up. That's the key. Jesus said so. But when you don't teach the word of God, then you've got to use human things to prop it up. 
And you've got to scheme and plot, and you've got to have a money drive, and, you, and you've got to threaten people and almost bully them into action. Listen, when the word of God really gets inside of your heart, you can no longer sit around. It begins to percolate. It catches fire like a little spark starts in your soul and you're learning and you're growing. And then all of a sudden, you know what? It's so cool. Supernaturally, the Bible's got to come out of you. I mean, you, I grew up, I grew up uh, back when dinosaurs ruled the earth. <laughs> Does anybody remember those Pyrex? Coffee pots that were crystal clear, remember? And you put coffee up. My parents would put coffee in the top thing and they put the lid on and they'd turn on the stove and it would be, the, bo- the water would boil and then it would begin to percolate and then the whole house smelled so great. But you could see the coffee going like this. It started out crystal clear and then it turned into just amazing coffee. What's the deal? What was there was exposed to action. Heat is action. You know that, right? And so all of these molecules began to collide into each other and they started boiling. And out of the explosion came a very pleasurable smell and drink. Okay. So watch this. Christianity in you is like that. Truth gets inside and it begins to percolate. It's a supernatural act. And as the Bible is believed and as you have it and ingest it and believe this is God's word in me. It begins to boil ever so gently. And then it begins to get louder and stronger until it's brewing. And the Christian that is full of the Holy Spirit is a Christian that is reliant upon the word. And the Holy Spirit will take the word and guess what? He'll use you. This is what he does. And so our deeds can never measure up because true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is God the Holy Spirit doing the work in and through you. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 verse 8, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. What a tremendous statement of faith. Here's also a description of a life that is transformed. And 1 John 4, 17, it says, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness. Remember this from last week, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he, that is Christ is, so are we in this world. We talked about you and I in this life of ours as a believer, making visible to the world around us, the invisible God. That's how the world, until Christ comes, that's how the world sees the Lord, is by him working through you. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, the Bible there says, He who says he abides in him, that is, lives with Christ, ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Isn't that amazing? That's encouraging. Very, very cool. Our deeds, my friend, can never measure up, nor can deeds get you to walk like Jesus walked. It's not going to happen. He, that's why Jesus said to Matthew and to the disciples, come and follow me. He didn't say, come and do the things I'm going to show you. He said, follow me. And in following him, that takes faith. Amen. And in following him, things begin to happen. And so we pick it up where we left off. Here it is, church. Look at verse 2 at the end. It says there that our pride is laid low before God. And that's a good thing. Our pride is laid low before God. How so? Verse 2 tells us, but not before God. Abraham can boast to his friends and to his family about his cattle or his sheep or his camels, but he cannot boast before anybody regarding his relationship with God. There's no bragging rights for the believer to talk about how great thou art when you're talking about yourself in the light of knowing God. It's not even, it's not even allowed. God won't allow it. If you know a Christian who's proud, get your camera out. Follow them around. You're going to have some great YouTube video to post. Because if they're proud and they're a Christian, it won't last for long. You're going to see them take a big fall. God loves them, so he's going to humble them. They may lose all their money. They may lose all their power. Listen, like as in my family with my parents and even my sister, they lost all of their health. 
And then they looked up. And my family, as I said before, cancer has been the great evangelist in my home. What my family wouldn't listen to, they wound up being whittled away until there was no strength left in them until they said, Jesus, save me. Jesus, I surrender. Listen, I don't care. I don't care. We, Lisa and I, like you, we pray for our kids. We pray for our grandkids. I do not care what happens to their lives as God determines so long as they get to heaven. Amen. If God forbid, but if, my, if, if our daughters or our grandsons or granddaughters, if, they, if they're going to be stubborn about things, you know what? God, you deal with them. But whatever you do, Lord, don't let up. Don't let up. Do what you must do to get them into the kingdom of heaven. I don't want them to have an easy life now and wind up in hell later. Right? I want them to know. And the Bible tells us clearly that before God, we are all put on the level field as it were before the throne. And uh, Revelation 1, 17 and 18, I love this verse. And again, for some of you, look, I, uh, three services last week, three services every week on Sunday. I forget which verses I hit on and ones I didn't. So if you already have them in your note, if you got them in your notes from last week, just uh, skip over it. Uh, maybe, maybe I said it at second service. It doesn't matter. Here's the deal. It's God's word, so eat it up. And especially this verse. This verse drives some of our cult friends crazy. And so it's an extra bonus. This one. <laughs> Revelation 1, 17 and 18. John said, I saw him and I fell at his feet dead as a dead guy. John just passed out on his face. But he laid his right hand upon me and he said to me, saying, do not be afraid. Here it comes. I am the first and the last. That's the name of God right out of the book of Isaiah. Amen. I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. And all God's people said? Yeah. This is awesome. Whoever the uh, first and the last, in fact, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who was, who is, who is to come, all of those out of the Old Testament, all ascribed to Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, yeah, that's me. And guess what? I live and I died, but I live again. Does that, does that, does that kind of describe anybody you know by the name of Jesus Christ born in Bethlehem? This is the scripture. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, Isaiah said, sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe or his glory filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphim, type of angel. Each one had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one cried to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door was shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. Verse 5, so I said, this is Isaiah. I said, woe is me, for I am undone. There you go. Undone. The Christian, when we look at our own self deeds, we should look at ourselves and conclude with Isaiah. I'm undone. Even if I do the best thing ever, it's still undone because my motive is probably goofy. Made sure I was smiling the moment I handed out the food to the poor. You know, whatever. I mean, do by all means hand out food to the poor, but don't do it for a photo op. For I am undone, he said, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes, here's the reason, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. that would do it to you. Daniel 8, 27, Daniel said, I fainted, and I was sick for many days afterward when he saw the revelation of God, when he saw the manifestation of heaven. Everybody wants to write a book about their... Near-death experience. Just save it, will you? We don't need another book about heaven. We have the Bible. And by the way, I don't mean to offend anybody, but it's, it's not a good day when all these people claim that they went to heaven and you're supposed to believe what they saw, but how come their, their books contradict one another? 
or there's things said in there that have nothing to do with scripture whatsoever. You know, there's books out there written by non-believers about their death and coming back experience. And they'll tell you in those books, you don't need to be afraid of death. You can embrace it because there's just nothing after death. I was just very aware of nothing after death. Well, if I was Satan, I would tell that unbeliever, don't worry about a thing. Just tell everybody, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. You don't have to worry about anything. Isn't that satanic? Yes. Satan just pulls out his Stradivarius, and he's just putting you to sleep with some dum-dum song, spiritual dum-dum. I don't need to worry about anything, man. You know, I read this guy's book, and he didn't have any faith in God. And when he died, he just thought, he said it was cool. You're going to take that guy's word over the written word of God. Watch out, people. It could be like a guy laying down on a tarmac at an airport with a, ba- with a bag over his body, supposed to be dead. And he keeps putting the bag back over his body to say that he's dead. Watch out. Be wise. Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Philippians 2, 10, 11 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God the Father sent his Son, Jesus Christ, into this world. God was born into this world in human skin. That's the greatest miracle of it all. That is amazing. Everything comes out from that. You and I going to heaven, it's because God took on skin. Sin's forgiven because God took on skin. Don't you want to talk about the cross? Of course, but the cross happened because God took on skin. You want to talk about the empty tomb? Of course I do, but it's because God took on skin. He came into this world. And I thank God he became one of us. He didn't become, you know, a a whale or a, a butterfly or something. He became us. Amazing. When eyes can hear us, number two, church, is found in verse three, and that is there is no way to lose. And again, this is all in the positive. This is all very positive. Verse three, we learn this that salvation is founded on the scriptures, church, family. Salvation is founded on the scriptures. How can we be sure? Listen, for those of you who are here today, you may be watching right now, you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to know I understand where you're at. You don't understand. You don't know. You've not studied. You've not, you have not discovered yet that the Bible is transcendent. That this book that God gave to mankind is absolutely inerrant in the original languages. Did you know that? There's no errors in the Bible. And not only that, but it's historically perfect. In other words, what the Bible says Secular history confirms there was really a Hittite kingdom, for example. There really was a Babylon and a Babylonian king. How do we know if there was ever a real Nebuchadnezzar? Go to the British Museum of History. And there's the artifacts. And of course, every time, I think it's Psalm 85, I may be wrong, but Psalm 85 says something to the effect, maybe around verse 4, that... Out of the earth springs forth truth. And I, if I was an archaeologist, I'd have a t-shirt with that on it. Because every time you put a shovel in the ground where you're, where you're testing the Bible, guess what you find? You find the coinage, you find the pottery, you find the bones, and sometimes you find the inscriptions. The Bible can't be true. There's no evidence. We can't find nothing that there was ever a Herod or a Pontius Pilate until people put a shovel in the ground and find very the very inscriptions of these leaders. We don't know if that governor at the birth of Jesus, that governor that's named in, uh, in Syria in the Gospels was even true. We can't find anything. And then they put a shovel in the ground and they find out that he was the literal governor of Syria when Jesus Christ was born. Our faith is founded upon fact. And if that's not enough, Bible prophecy is the, the overriding power 
God announces the future in advance. He writes it down. It's called Bible prophecy. Puts it down on paper and then he says, watch and see. Christian, there's no way for you and I to lose. Because our very salvation is founded upon the scriptures. It's like a road sign. And by the way, think about this. Like kind of a little bit of an attitude check on this one. That there's no way for you and I to lose. So we ought to get excited about that. Our salvation is founded upon the scriptures. And um, here's what I wrote to myself and I'll share it with you. How responsive are you? And I'll make it personal how it came to me. This is how I study the Bible. When I read something, it touches my heart. So how responsive am I, Jack, to follow directions? Do I follow directions well? You ask yourself that question. See, what does that have to do with anything? It has everything to do with this. Salvation is founded upon the scriptures. Amen. So my first question to you is, how responsive are you in following directions? Number two, when it comes to obeying a command or reading the instructions in a manual, how compliant are you or how willing are you to follow those directions? There's some people that will not, they will not allow themselves to follow any instructions. I have to be honest. When I get something in the mail or whatever it is, or if, I, if the box arrives, I don't read the instructions. So when am I going to learn? I don't read the instructions because I don't have the time. I got to put this thing together. I got to go. And when I'm done with it, Lisa will say, I thought we ordered them a tricycle. <laughs> where's, the, what's that, so what's, where's the other wheel? <laughs> and then because I didn't read the instructions, it takes twice the amount of time. If I just would have paused to read it. But me, I'm in a hurry. But some people, they won't read the instructions because they actually know better than the guy or the team that designed that thing. You know what I'm saying? Honey, aren't you going to read those instructions? For what? What do you think? I'm a fool? Come on. Can't be that hard. You ever heard that before? Of course not. <laughs> we would never admit that. But you say, oh, Jack, that's all just those kinds of things. No, 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 here's where I'm going, Scripture. Scripture says this. How do you handle that? When the Bible says this about that and that about this, how do you handle it? Do you, you fight with them? Do you say things like this? Well, I know the Bible says, but I think God wants me happy. I mean, I know he wants me happy. Yeah. And so, have you ever heard that before? Yeah. Listen, this is an... This is a, this is, a, this is an untamed spirit. This is, these are the words of an unregenerate person. When you look at the word of God, and it doesn't translate over to you and I obeying it. That we bend it at times to fit what we want. Gosh, if, if she wasn't supposed to be in my life, then why would God give me the incredible feelings that I have? He didn't. It's called biology and chemistry. It's called life. Take every relationship to God. Judge it against scripture. Has somebody asked you, hey, let's invest together on this thing. Watch out. What does the Bible say? Test everything. But most importantly, regarding salvation... We better test that. It's so vitally important. For what does the scripture say? Verse 3, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Incredible. The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. I want all of you to learn that. That's not hard to learn. I mean it. I'm not joking. This is not any bombacity or hyperbole. I want you to learn that simple statement. The Bible says. When the, you come up against something or someone or if you encounter some spiritual warfare, let me tell you, the Bible says, the Bible says, you and I have, listen, this always, this always upsets some people who come from certain denominational persuasions. They always get upset when I say what I'm about to say. The only authority that you and I have is the word of God. 
well, no, I have the authority to do this and I have the authority to, you have the authority to do nothing. Amen. Nope, I'm going to claim this and I'm going to tell God this is because, <laughs> come on. I mean, that is just crazy. We come before him. Even Jesus said, Father, if there's any other way that this cup can pass from me, let it be so. Nevertheless, nevertheless, thy will be done. And he went to the cross. Listen, the authority that you and I have is the word of God at work in our lives. And when the word of God is at work in our lives, it comes out of our lives And you should have absolute confidence based upon the authority of scripture that if you were to breathe your last breath today, you'd go to heaven. Your salvation is foundational and revelation in scripture. It's not a guess. The question then comes to you. Are you truly a believer? Are you a true follower of Christ? Very important. Genesis chapter 17, verse 4. You guys okay? I know I've been yelling at you so early in the morning. Genesis, uh, I get caught up and then my heart rate gets going and then I get pumped up and then... So... As for me, behold, my covenant is with you. That's God speaking to Abraham. And you shall be a father of many... What? The word in Hebrew is goy. Nations, plural. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. Goy. Verse 6. I, God says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations of you. Is this awesome? And kings shall come from you. Look at verse 7. I will establish my covenant between me and you. And your descendants after you in their generations. For an everlasting covenant. To be God to you and your descendants after you. Verse 8. He says this. Listen to this. This is the origin of the the promise. I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger. All the land of Canaan or Israel as an everlasting possession and I will be their God. So notice this. He's God. He's going to give promised land to Abraham's descendants by DNA, by blood, called Canaan or Israel, but he's also the God of the Goy, the nations. And I get excited about that, friends, because my Old Testament says that that salvation is mine also. I can demand it. On what grounds? On scripture. I remind all my Jewish friends all the time, I may not be Jewish, but my God, my God is And uh, I've been grafted into all of your promises. The fun, the fun thing is most of them don't believe the promises. Right? We do. Drives them crazy. Because they want to. They, how do you, how, where'd, you, where'd you find that? It's in the Bible. I've never seen that before. You should read it. A lot of stuff in there. A friend of mine had a big, big Bible. Old, big Bible. This is cute, man. I mean... If I had a bigger house, I would do this. He had a big Bible on their coffee table. And when they were raising their little kids, you know what they did? All throughout the Bible, they put, throughout the pages, they put candy in the pages. And those kids grew up. You know what those kids, now they're grown up adults. Yep, our dad taught us that the Bible is full of sweet things. Man, that's a comfort. So then whose God is he? He's the God of those who believe in him. Put faith in him. You guys all learned a long time ago in this study that a physical act of circumcision 
cannot save you. It doesn't matter how deep you're baptized underwater, does it? Yeah, but you don't know. You, you, went, you went under 12 inches. I went under. That guy held me down three feet deep. <laughs> so what does that mean? I'm just telling you. I was really baptized. Doesn't that sound so, doesn't that sound dumb? Well, I'm going to go to heaven because I was circumcised. I'm sorry, that's dumb. That's just dumb. I want to remind you, the first man who was declared righteous was an uncircumcised Gentile, but he met the God who transforms lives. In fact, listen, 17 times in the Old Testament, the Bible says it is written. 17 times. Like, here's an example. Joshua 8.31, it says, As Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses. Okay? 17 times. Do you know how many times it is written appears in the New Testament? 63 times. You want to know why? Every one of those declarations in the New Testament is putting you back to an Old Testament quote. 17 times in the Old Testament it says it is written, but 63 times in the New refers you back to it is written and more. Bible, 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 Bible. So when Paul says according to the scriptures, we're talking about the Old Testament. Professor F.F. Bruce wrote this, Abraham simply took God at his word and acted accordingly. Can you take a picture of that? Can you guys remember this? This is perfect. Abraham simply took God at his word and acted accordingly. That's faith. That's faith. Period. This is liberating. I read it. It's God's word. I'm going to act on it. I'm going to obey. Hmm. James chapter 2 verse 20. James 2.20 says, now watch, this is fun because you'll see uh, in a moment why this is vital. Pay close attention, everyone. James 2.20. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? That's true, you know. Faith without works is dead. It goes right into our title of the message, doesn't it? Think about that. What somebody says, what I hear, what somebody does, what I see, do those things agree? He goes on, verse 21, James chapter 2. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? I want everybody to look at that. Are you guys all thinking? You wake? Yes. Watch everyone say, oh my goodness, Pastor Jack, you've been talking for months about justification by faith alone. That's right. Watch this. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? The answer to that is yes. But listen, yes before who? Go back and read what happened in Genesis. Abraham said, we're going to go to Mount Moriah and I'm going to offer my son there believing that even if he should kill his son, which he didn't, God was able to raise him from the dead to bring from him the descendant and ultimately the descendant, the Messiah, but a whole nation. So which came first? The offering up of Isaac or faith to go and offer up Isaac? Faith took him to Moriah, right? Watch this. But before... This world, what we see, is what's done. The book of James announces to us, our true faith is observable when we see among one another that it is true that what you preach and what you believe according to the scriptures is how you live. You don't preach one thing and then get caught in a hotel snorting cocaine with a prostitute. But that's the news this morning. 
Something's wrong. You see this? No, the truth is, here's the deal. You can say yes and amen to all of these things, but has this Bible changed your life? Thank you, Jesus, yes. Abraham's life was so changed by faith that he went probably weeping, thinking, my son, listen, I'm, I'm speculating now. I underline, I only speculate. Abraham obeyed God. He gets two attendants and his son, and they get the donkeys, they load them up, and away they go, and God says, I'll show you the place. I'll show you in the land of Moriah. I'll show you where. Ab- only Abraham knows this. Abraham's walking along, and then they get to the hill, and Abraham turns and says to the two servants, listen to this. You both stay right here. I and my son are going to go to the mountaintop and we're going to worship God. And when we're done, we will return back to you. We. Oh, all of a sudden, I have pee wee faith. So, like A.W. Tozer points out, did Abraham weep? Did Abraham struggle? Did Abraham have a hard time? Yes. When that old man got to that hilltop, the struggle that's within him, can you imagine? Oh, God. It wasn't that he was going to raise, he wasn't struggling with God about raising his son. That was done. God absolutely was going to win the day. Do you know what Abraham was concerned about? Can you imagine afflicting your child with pain? Can you imagine plunging a knife into your child's heart? And then what about the image? Oh, God in heaven, please. When, after you resurrect him from the dead, when he is resurrected from the dead, can he not remember what I did to him? We don't know what kind of struggles he went through, but it was a struggle of faith. He believed God and he obeyed. His faith was intact, but it was a struggle of faith. So like you and me. Every day. We're still in James though, right? Yes. Verse 22, do you, do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made complete or perfect? Of course. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, notice the order, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Do you see? Yes. The, three of you saw that? You, yes. Did you all see that? <laughs> And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith. Thank God for that word on the end. What is the word? Oh, only. Everybody can talk about faith. Well, let's see it. You see? Because faith works, friends. Faith works. I mean, faith equals works. Never does works equal faith. (laughs) Never. Once, uh, once after birth, as it were, when faith is born, those two things are inseparable. Faith and works. It's impossible to only have faith. I, 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 I seem like I bring the guy up every week, but he's just so perfect. The thief on the cross. What works did he have? He had this. He had a confession. He had a testimony. And it was just simply this. Jesus, remember me when you come back. When you come into your kingdom, will you just remember me? That was a declaration of faith, believing that Jesus would be resurrected from the dead and he was going to come back and rule the earth. And all that guy wanted was, will you just remember me? Because I ain't got nobody in my life. I've been a hoodlum. I've been a bum, crook, thief, mugger all my life. It'd be awesome that if somebody would ever remember me. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. What a beautiful moment. Even even his faith worked, didn't it? Romans chapter 10, verse 14. We're almost done. I mean, we're not almost done. We're almost out of time. Romans 10, 14. There's a big difference. Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. 
For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Verse 17. So then, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Isn't that awesome? This is a, now, this is a big one. We're going to go to Luke 24. Big chunk of scripture. It's probably as far as we'll get. Uh, let's see. Lord, please cause that clock to stop. <laughs> uh, we're going to celebrate this in just a few weeks, right? Yes. Resurrection morning. Luke 24, verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, very early in the morning... They and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, embalming fluid. It's what they did. They didn't put it in the body. Embalming fluid, they put it on the wrappings of the grave cloths themselves, the strips of clothing, of uh, material. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened that as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments, angels, no doubt. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is hilarious. Why do you seek their living among the dead? My answer would have been, excuse me, will you look around? It's a graveyard, hello. <laughs> it's almost, these angels have got a little attitude. A little bit of sassiness to this. I, I, I'd love to have seen this. He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee? Saying, verse 7, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. So the light comes on. <gasps> right! We remember now. You know, grief can do that to you. They were grieving. They had lost hope. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the 11. Remember, Judas had already hung himself, so there's 11 now. And to all the rest, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. The disciples now are apostles. But not yet. Isn't that amazing? The Bible says apostles. See, who cares? It's pretty amazing because they're not apostles yet. To be an apostle, you've got to say something. Right now, they hadn't said anything. The word apostle is to, speak, is to be the messenger that speaks the message. <laughs> Verse 11. And their words seemed, listen, the great apostles. And their words seemed to them to be like idle tales. And they did not believe them, the great faith that they had. But Peter, thank God for Peter, arose and ran to the tomb. And stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves. And he departed, marveling to himself what had happened. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they walked together of all these things which had happened. So it was that while they were, uh, while they conversed and reasoned, imagine, wouldn't you love to hear these two disciples or whoever they are talking, right? That Jesus himself drew near and went with them. So he pulls alongside them. There's three of them now walking on the path. And their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have one with another as you walk and are sad. Is this fun? This is God talking. Is this not precious? Yes. I mean, come on, wake up, friend. Get, loosen up for a second. This is Jesus. This is God in skin, resurrected from the dead, saying, hey, guys, what are you talking about? Can, can I come in on this? What's, you guys are obvious. Whatever you're talking about, you're really sad. Why are you sad? He knew why they were sad. Verse 18, then one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? <laughs> and have you not known the things which happened there in these days? <laughs> and he said to them, uh, what things? <laughs> is he awesome? This is God. <laughs> he 
he's so, remember, remember, by the way, we laugh because it's so cute. But remember, God always deals in your life to get faith to come up out of you. Remember when the woman touched him with the bleeding? And he said, who touched me? Did he know who touched him? Of course he knew. Remember when we read it a few weeks ago, when the crumbs fell from the children's, the breadcrumbs fell to the ground and the Gentile woman was wanting salvation. Jesus said, it's not right to give the bread to the little puppies, the little dogs, that the bread falls from the table. This is for the children of Israel. And she goes, yes, but puppies do eat the bread that falls to the ground. And Jesus said, okay, that's it, you got me. <laughs> I've not seen such great faith, no, not in all of Israel like this. He's always drawing you in to a faith experience. That's why he doesn't answer you in prayer the way that you think. Then it wouldn't be faith. He answers the way it must be. So they said to him the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a mighty prophet in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping, past tense, our hope's gone. We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today's the third day since these things have happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb earlier, remember we read that a second ago? Astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And a certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, and, but he did not see him. Then he said to them, Jesus says to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe. Watch in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? That's Old Testament theology, friends. Pure and simple. Isaiah 53. Psalm 22. And beginning at Moses and all of the prophets, Jesus expounded to them all the scriptures The things concerning himself. Your Bible. Your salvation is anchored in these scriptures. Your salvation is only as certain as these scriptures. How's that? I'm not threatening you right now. I'm giving you hope you can't lose. You're only going to live as long in eternity as God lives. Right? You can only be declared righteous as Jesus is. That's what the Bible says. We still have we have we have a moment. Look at verse look at verse four. Salvation is independent of human effort. I'll go through this very quickly. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. I just need to say I'll just say this. You cannot you, if you're working your salvation, if you think being good is going to get you into heaven, then God, listen, you've negated grace. You're working as you do for your boss. If you work eight hours and you get $5 an hour and he pays you, you deserve it and you got it. In fact, your boss could go to jail for not paying you it. Mm-hmm. Right? Why? Because you work and your boss is indebted to you. Did you know that every company is indebted to their employees who work before they even give them their paycheck? You want to know why? The law demands you pay them for their work. You're going to work your way to heaven? I got news for you. You will never be, you'll never have God be indebted to your works. You want to relate to God in doing good and doing uh, uh, deeds and all this stuff apart from the blood? Then don't, then it's not grace. There's no grace involved. It's wages. And he'll pay you wages based upon perfection because that's the standard. It's not good. And then we'll end here. This is the really. (laughs) Verse verse five. Salvation is a radical transformer 
Salvation is a radical transformer. Church, listen, it. salvation is independent of human works. And salvation in all of its precious glory is something that has absolutely nothing to do with our effort. But it is founded upon the validity of scripture, Bible, Bible, Bible. That's how people mess up. They don't pay attention to Bible in their lives. To him, verse 5, it says, to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. Oh my goodness, the ungodly can be made just. His faith is accounted in for righteousness. So listen, I have a big question for you. Listen, notice the obvious here. According to the Bible, the ungodly can become godly. How does that happen? Wow, think of it. It's not his faith that makes him righteous. Remember, it's not his faith that makes him righteous. It's where his faith is placed. And Abraham placed his faith in God. Salvation's radical, friends. Second Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. He's atoned for, technically. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Colossians 2.9, for in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily in Jesus Christ is the manifestation of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. So I'm going to end this way. What did John Wesley say? I felt my heart strangely warmed when he heard the book of Romans taught. In John chapter 9, verse 15, church, the man was blind. He's been touched by Jesus. He can see now. And he's being questioned by the authorities. And he answered and said, whether, it is, whether he is a sinner or not, they were accusing Jesus of being a magician. Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know Though I was blind, now I see. <laughs> I love that. Just, let's just reduce this down. I don't care who you're talking about. What do you want us to say about it? I was blind. He showed up. I see. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> then they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And the man answered and said to them, I told you already, and you do not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> And, and verse 28 says, then they reviled him. How could you? <laughs> you, know, you are his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we do not know where he's from. They argued. All I know, listen, we end this. We, you, you stand, you can stand. Worship team can come out. Listen to this. All of this in your life and mine, friends. The message of salvation. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. 2,000 years ago. Just like he died on the cross 2,000 years ago. But he paid the price of Abraham's debt thousands of years before that. At the cross. Abraham was saved on credit. Looking to the cross. You and I are saved looking back. So I leave you with this. Does the word of God, what does the word of God do to you? That blind man, I bet you, it's no stretch to say, he began, his, he began to feel his heart strangely warm. Listen, what about the woman with that issue of blood? I bet you she would have admitted, you know what, the blood, yeah, the blood stopped. Praise the Lord. But I felt my heart strangely warmed. What about the two beggars on the side of the road? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. And everybody told them, be quiet. The master's coming by. It's Jesus. Keep your mouth shut. And the Bible says the more they told them to shut up, the louder they got. Why? Listen, Jesus walks by. And it's great. He walks by. They're blind guys. They're two blind guys. Jesus walks by. Excuse me. What do you want me to do for you? We thought you'd get us like some black tainted window camels, a few couple of limo, limousine donkeys. No, we want to see. He knew they said it. 
I think they felt their hearts strangely warmed. When the word of God goes out, do you find your heart being strangely warmed? I pray so. If you feel feel that your heart is being touched by God and awakening your soul to interest, to have interest in him, you should invite him into your life. Have him wash away your sins. He's waiting to do that. He's so good. Father, as we sing to you praises now, may we mean it with all of our hearts. Lord, the way the world's going, it's getting pretty simple. Things are getting really reduced, simply. Can't afford to go anywhere. Can't afford to do anything. Uh, World War III being threatened. This is a really good time to go to heaven. It's a really good time to get ready for heaven. So Lord, we pray today that as a church family, we'd have our faith anchored in you and in you alone. That we would rejoice with song and praise for all of your great merit that you've bestowed upon us. The just shall live by faith. And so Lord, we praise you now. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless. Salvation, the most important decision of your life, is as simple as ABC. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 A. Admit that you are a sinner. Here's the bad news. We all have a problem. It's called sin. Our lives are not how God intended them to be. The consequence of sin is eternal death. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6.23 B. Believe in Jesus Here's the good news. God gives us so much that He can forgive any sin, no matter how big or how small. God sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross to save us from sin. Jesus said that if you put your trust in him, you will have eternal life. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. John 6.40 C. Confess that Jesus is Lord. When Jesus rose from the grave, he proved his victory over eternal death. God wants you to confess that Jesus is Lord of all. He is your Savior. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10.9 I suggest praying the following prayer to accept Christ as your Savior. Dear God, I know I am a sinner, 
and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I believe that he died for my sin and that you raised him to life. I want to trust him as my savior and follow him as Lord. From this day forward, guide my life and help me do your will. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to the Forever Family of God.